Hi, this is Ann Richards, and I am starting my new season of Pep Talks, Passion Equals Purpose, and I'm super excited about my first guest for the new season. I'd like to introduce and welcome George Hahn. Annie! <laughs> <laughs> so, George um, is such a great choice because he... He is a Cleveland-bred friend of mine who has had a path back and forth to Cleveland, back to New York, where we are now actually recording, and he's become sort of a public figure of late um, in the social media world. So, George, thank you so much for being here. And I'm so thrilled that you asked. <laughs> we should give like an even further backstory, like how we know each other. 100%. Yeah. So, so George and I go way back to Lakewood, Ohio, where his sister, Megan, mm -hmm. was one of my dear friends growing up. So I spent a lot of time at their beautiful Georgian classic. The old house on Lake Avenue. It was stunning. So George was, I mean, when I met you, so... If I was hanging out with Megan 15, 16, you were how old? I would have been 11 and 12, oh 13. My. I was in, you guys were in high school. I was in junior high, like just starting junior high. And so cute. Because you got, oh, so and, cute. And what happened, right? No. <laughs> and yeah, when you guys graduated, we didn't overlap in high school. You had no. graduated when I was a freshman. Mm -hmm. You were gone. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I know. And I remember very well you went to Boston College. Mm -hmm. And I think we even, I remember being on a vacation together in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> Howard School of Embalmment. An Alamo rent a car. Oh my gosh. And you would make me laugh so hard. Your, uh, your skills as, I don't know, good comedy skills developed. I Where did that come from? My dad. Your dad was amazing. He was funny. I loved him. Um, got another thing from He'd that He'd sit in Florida. that study. Oh, God, the library. Yes, and if, if you got called in there, Oh, I've watch talked about out. this. When, <laughs> when we screwed up as kids, when we got in trouble, the drill was at least a day, sometimes two, or maybe even more, if I remember right, of silence from dad. Like, we'd get the silent treatment, like, Breakfast in the morning was awkward. And yeah. Then, like dinner that night was awkward. Um, and then after dinner, or maybe even before dinner, so that dinner could be civil, uh, you'd get the talk in the library. And dad would give you the talking to. Um, yeah, he was never physical. It was just a real, um, he could wilt you through the floor with a stare down. And the worst thing that you could do was disappoint dad. Absolutely. And I make it, I mean, he wasn't, I make it sound like he's some, you know, he, my dad was a really good man, you know. Yes. Um, and um, so I think if I had kids today, I think I'd borrow a lot from his playbook. Yeah. Yeah. He had some good tools. He did. He did. And he was um, he was a sober person. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure that if he didn't, he didn't listen to his better angels – Mm -hmm. He would probably have yelled a lot more. Yeah. Um, but he had that, he had the gift and grace of that, uh, you know, getting sober and examining oneself and doing a little inventory and looking at some stuff about his own life that was perhaps unpleasant at the time and um, was a better man for it. Sure. Yeah. Um, Which I think explains also why he was so strict on Megan and all of us when it came to like drinking in high school. Oh, absolutely. It was a zero tolerance policy. It was, I remember. Yeah. But somehow we still broke it. I know. <laughs> I don't know how. I mean, I got busted a few times. but. So I love to ask the guests, um, what was your first job? My first like official sign a form job or my first means of income? Means of income. Mowing lawns. Mm -hmm. I used to mow the Livingston's lawn next door. Yeah. That was my first check from yeah. Mr. Livingston, Joan and Jim. And um, after that, um, I cleaned cars. That uh, I remember. We had a f our mutual friend who was in your class, Timmy Berry, mm -hmm. had a car cleaning business, and I admired Timmy for that so much. And I started doing it on my own when I had a license. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Because I think that ba – I love that – it's like what you were interested in 
starts, I think, when you're young, where we bring it. So you loved, I would say, order and mm. cleanliness and things looking good. Yes. And shiny. Yes. And that newness. There was something about that, I think, because yeah. from what I recall, that became a big business for you, and you were very good at it. The cars? Yeah. I, you know, I, for a teenage kid, you know, I had a pretty good work ethic, and I got to a point where I actually needed to hire some help, and I hired some um, kids, like some friends, and they worked for me, and yeah. it made us, and it enabled us to do more cars in a day. I think mm -hmm. we were able to do, if it was like a full wash and wax, sometimes it was just a wash, and that would take under an hour, or like a half hour, um, but like we did a full detail. Mm-hmm. You know, we could do like two or three in a day. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So my the premise for the show, Passion Equals Purpose, is essentially my belief that everyone has these passions, mm -hmm. some of us more than others, that make your way into your purpose in life. And right. it's it's a windy road for most of us. And But I do feel like all those things that you went along the way brought you into what you're doing, mm -hmm. which we don't always know until we get here and we look back and, you know, like yeah. I, I lived in New York and oh, I d was an actress when I was here, but I, and I loved exercise and, and then those things are still in my life today. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that yeah. I loved it. So would you say then when you went to college, did you start to develop your love of acting in college around then? I would, I think I always had it. Right. I always had, I am my father's son, my dad, and I owe a lot to him in terms of my, um, I guess, performative attributes. Um, my dad was an actor, um, and then uh, he was a great MC of events. Like, I think my dad's dream job, if he had ever gotten the opportunity, would have been like a talk show host. Yeah. Um, even a game show host, you know? My dad was very, he was a real good master of ceremonies very quick, witty. Um, so I get it from him. Yeah. And I always wanted to do it. And you know where we grew up. And yes. I, like, we had this very um, Catholic, conservative kind of upbringing. And as a boy, like, boys didn't sing. No. You know? You had to what, play sports. Like, queer boys did that. Yes. And you had to play sports. And I tried that, and I tried to fit in there, and I yes. was always, you know, a square peg in a round hole there. Like, I just, it never clicked. Um, and where I went to school, St. Luke's, there was no outlet for that for no. me at all. No, And at Ignatius, at St. Ignatius, where I went to high school, there was the, there were the Harlequins, the theater um, group there, but I was still too self-conscious and ashamed to try. I did audition for one play. Yeah. Uh, there was a production of M.A.S.H., <laughs> at Ignatius and I remember I auditioned for it I didn't get it but I never auditioned for anything again until freshman year in college because I was away from Cleveland yeah I yes. was away from that group that I thought was going to make fun of me mm -hmm. that I felt afraid of and intimidated by yeah um and when you go to when you go to college in a different town or whatever you have the opportunity to reinvent sure and so I had a little more Courage, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And um, nobody, nobody I knew was looking. You know, I was with out of earshot and eyesight from mm -hmm. anybody who could have like hurt my ego or my feelings. Absolutely. So that empowered me to audition for my first play, which I got. No, I didn't. I didn't get my first play. Uh, but freshman year, I started theater pretty pretty much right away. And then, that's also when you came out. Mm, not till junior year. Junior year. I had girlfriends all through junior year. You did. Uh, well, all through the first two years. <gasps> so, like, uh, what was going through your head at the time? I wanted to fit in. And got to remember, where we grew up, again, about yes. that, like, oh. I call it the Cleveland Catholic Closet. Mm -hmm. And I talked about this on a podcast earlier this year. Um, where we grew up, give me cancer. Give me a lost limb in a car accident. Worse than any of that was to be or be merely thought of as a homo. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. If the word was out, even if you weren't and people thought you were. Yeah. But let's be real. But the worst thing that could happen to you or the worst thing that anybody could think of you where we grew up is if you were gay. 
Sure. And I did everything in my power. To try and get over it. To watch, I monitored how I pronounced my S's. I didn't let anybody know that I had Madonna records. I didn't, like, I mean, it was down to that. Yeah. So when you went to BC, you were still trying. Yeah. You were going to get the gay, like, right. get it out. Yeah. And then it wasn't until, oh, um, there was a play that I did junior year called The Normal Heart by Larry Kramer. It was made into a movie for HBO. Great play. Yeah. And um, I got cast in the lead, as the lead in that show, uh, which is basically the role of Larry Kramer. And um, that character was an out and loud gay man. Mm -hmm. And there were other um, gay actors in the cast. And it was a very transformative experience. And it gave me courage. And I came out after that. I came out loud, like, not to my, my family coming out was different. Um, I came out publicly rather loudly at school yeah in the form of a letter to the editor of the paper which was read by 10,000 undergrads wow I came out loud I thought if I'm gonna do this I'm not gonna I'm not gonna soft step it mm -hmm. so it was loud my mother that was a different story I know and do you know that story no after sophomore year you know my gay rumblings were starting to sort of surface a little more um boldly I guess and I was back home in Cleveland for the summer it was my last summer in Cleveland because dad died freshman year and then I was home for that summer then I went back to school for sophomore year and then came back to Cleveland after that mm -hmm. and I was on the phone with a friend of mine this is before cell phones and I was on the phone with a friend of mine from school and uh, this friend of mine was also gay and unbeknownst to me my mother was also on the phone and she listened to the entire conversation. Oh. And so after the phone call, I hung up with my friend, and then my mom came down to the basement, and she said, is there something you want to tell me? Oh, my gosh. And that's how that came about. Oh yeah. Oh, my gosh. Do you think she knew? I think so. I also think my dad knew. Mm-hmm. Um, mm, I'll tell you, um, Megan, your girlfriend, my sister, when dad was driving her to college – at St. Mary's, I believe. Um, she told me that dad asked her if I was, he said, I think George might be gay. Mm. She didn't tell me that till years later. Mm. And I didn't even know that about myself. Yeah. I was certainly not willing to face it or acknowledge it. Sure. You know, but the whole time I was, I was, I had a crush on like, you know, Mr. So-and-so. I yes. Don't reveal names because God knows who's listening and some of these <laughs> people are still alive. So I'll <laughs> shut my mouth there. I know. They are alive. Yeah. I don't know if they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, so then you're, and I know you've repeated this so many times recently, giving, so as more people get to know you, mm -hmm. they've heard your story. Mm -hmm. So if you want to cat, like, give us a little bit of uh, what's been going on since then. So you graduate. I graduate. You make your way to New York City. Eventually. I, was, I, I spun my wheels for about a year in Boston, did a little theater, and then moved here. Yeah. Yeah. So was that when you were living in Hell's Kitchen? My first apartment was on the Upper West Side. Actually, it was. Where I am now, same neighborhood. Um, and I was there for a year. I had the, my roommate James, whom I haven't seen in forever, but James kind of like was one of the people who like anti-maimed me through New York and introduced me around. And, yes. Um. And then I got my own place in Hell's Kitchen. And I was in Hell's Kitchen for like almost like 18 years. And you were auditioning. Yes. Um, backstage auditions. Yes. Like equity showcase. Yes. Brief nudity, no pay. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Did you get an agent or a manager? <laughs> I never had an agent except for one. I never had a manager. Um, I had one commercial agent. Okay. Briefly. Yeah. Um, she loves this story. I love this story. I'm having lunch. She's not my agent anymore, but she moved on to other things. But she worked for the Don Buckwald Agency. And mm -hmm. she, I was working at Film Center Cafe. Yes. On Ninth Avenue between 44th and 45th. Is it still there? No, it's gone. Okay. It was killed. Yeah, it was me. a cool place. It was cool. And um, it was a lunch shift. It was slow. I was by myself. The waiter didn't show up, so I was doing the whole place. It wasn't busy, but whatever. I was in a bad mood. And she came in. Serena came in, and she was with a girlfriend, and she said, 
are you an actor? And I said, unfortunately. And she said, what do you mean, unfortunately? I said, because I have to do this shit. Do you want something to drink? <laughs> <laughs> she Signed. laughed. Signed. Basically, that was it. Yeah. She said, you're hilarious. I like your voice. I'm going to try and get you in commercials. I never booked anything, though. Shucks. I was signed by them for two years. I didn't renew because nothing was happening. So. Isn't it strange? Because of how it's going now, and we'll get there, of what's happening with you now. But back then, it's like, and I can I was in the same business, living on the Upper West Side, waiting tables and acting mm-hmm. and auditioning. And it seems like back then, you were the perfect candidate for so many things. Yeah, but at the same, I think also, uh, I was trying to be someone I wasn't. Mm. I was trying to project straight still, even though I was oh. out socially. Like, I did, I had like... Some ec- uh, some under five work on soap operas. Yes. And a, d- a couple of day players. Yes. And I was told, don't let them know you're gay. Literally. So I monitored my behavior and, like, you know, m- it was very sort of conscious about who I was looking at or whatever or noticing on a set, on a Completely. soap. Like, you know, I <gasps> just made sure I was looking at boobs. You know what I mean? Like, oh, my gosh. Yes. 100%. Don't project gay. Don't let anyone think you're gay. If you want to wow. get if you want to get any traction in this business, do not let anyone think you're gay. So there it was again. Oh my goodness! And I think you know, um, a big jump cut to now, and we'll fill in the gaps. But like, I am at an age and a time now where I just don't give a fuck. Well, yeah, right. I like I don't. I was so worried about coming out and being authentic Mm -hmm. it's a word that gets bandied about now i think maybe overused but i don't know another word for it but like i was authentic uh i was vulnerable and going after what i really wanted yeah instead of you know i say this all the time like if i had gone the scripted path you know growing up in cleveland yeah what did i want i wanted to have a convertible and you know uh, have a house and a wife and two kids and maybe some secret gay sex on the side yeah. and golf at the country club. Which goes on. Hello. <laughs> it's happening. I like, you know, <laughs> I won't go into my first experience with yes, a man. Yes, yes. So um, that would have been my track. And I just, I was so consumed with the blast radius if I paired off with a man, if I let somebody know who I really am, what I really want, I was so afraid to articulate who I was and what I wanted because I was so afraid of the blast radius. I'm going to lose my friends. I'm going to lose my family. You know, at the end of the day, no one gave a shit. Right. You know? Yeah. At the end of the day, you learn who your friends really are. Um, so at that time, when I was sort of an aspiring actrician, with my head shot and mailing them into um, audition listings and backstage, I was desperately trying to project straight. Wow. Yeah. So what do you think was your biggest break? Sex in the City. So George. Where I played a gay man. <laughs> if you, <laughs> which finally, right? Yeah. And that was your biggest thing and you yeah. were being real. Yeah. You were being yourself. So if if you're listening and you don't know, George was on Sex in the City. What which season was it? Uh season two. Season two. Yeah. And he played he was in an apartment across the street from Cynthia Nixon, correct? Across the air shaft, like the alley. Like Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Which is kind of it's so creepy how close you are to those people. It and, is. It's I have the same kind of view outside my building. Currently. Like I think about it every time I look yes. out my window. Yes. It's like this is so me with Cynthia. Yes. Yeah. And jo- George appeared as naked as you could be, mm-hmm. right? On, yeah. I was on just TV. covering my front with a yes. towel. Um, which was marvelous. And you look amazing. Thank you. Was everyone how were they? It's all still you? in the same place too. <laughs> Twenty years later. Oh my gosh. Tighter than ever. Bounce a quarter I off that. I love ass. it. Yeah. <laughs> so you do. You look amazing. Thank you. You look exactly the same. Thank you. Um, how did you find that cast in that production? I mean, as I, far as the, the were the were they kind? How was this? Extremely. Yeah. I was very lucky. Again, I never had an agent. Uh, the associate casting director was a friend of mine. She used to be a regular at. Um, uh, Film Center Cafe. Mm-hmm. That's where I met her. She's still one of my good friends to this day. Okay. 
And she brought me in for a read. And I had been in to read like three times that summer. And I thought, oh, my God, they don't want me. And by the time I went out to do this audition for the role that I actually booked, mm-hmm. I was so over it. Yeah. It was out at Silver Cup. You had to take the subway to Queens. I was like, ugh, I'm so over this. They don't want me. Yeah. And that was the one I landed. Wow. Um, so you never know. It's like that. You don't. When someone asks you, like, how'd you do in the audition? Yeah. You're like, I felt good, but that means nothing. 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 And it's usually the ones, because when you think you got it, you didn't get it. Right. And then it's like the one you're like, yeah, I messed that up. Right. And somehow you get it. Yeah. It was interesting. Did you have formal training, like, for acting? Did you take class here? Not here. Oh, no, I take that back. I'm sorry. I did take one class in college, and then... I ended up being the TA for that class the year later, and then I took over the class because the teacher in the last quarter got ill, mm-hmm. and I would do the class for it and then bring the present, present the student's performance to him while he was recovering. Um, and then here I took a couple of classes at HB, Herbert Berghoff. Absolutely. I had, oh, I had two different teachers, mm-hmm. legends to me mm-hmm. anyway. My first teacher was Bill Hickey. Do you know who he was? Yes. Why is that name familiar? Bill Hickey was most famous for playing the Don in Pritzy's Honor. Okay. He looked, if he was 50, he looked 100. Okay. Bill lived hard. You know what I mean? Like he (laughs) spilled more than most people drank. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, smoked more than most people breathe. Yes. And by the time I, you know, was in his orbit, he was, had to be sort of like wheeled into the class, but he still had his wits about him. Yeah. He was very supportive of me. He's like, go be a star, go be a star. Um, Very funny, dry. Um, And then the other class I had was taught by the exquisite Elizabeth Wilson, who was um, probably most famous for playing Roz in 9 to 5. Okay. She was the one with that sort of like – that bob, that mm-hmm. gray bob with the bangs, yeah. the office Nazi, yeah. so to speak. And, and she was a marvelous teacher. She was amazing. She was also, she played Dustin Hoffman's mother in um, uh, The Graduate. Okay. Yeah. And she was amazing. She did a lot of, she was a Broadway legend, if you talk to certain people. And Elizabeth was marvelous. I loved her so much. Now, is H.P. the one in the village, the West mm-hmm. Village, yeah. when it wasn't the West Village? Uda Hagen and her husband, yes. Herbert Berghoff. I took classes there, George. Yeah. I think a lot of people went through there. It's still going, as far as I it know. It is? Yeah. Do you know, I want to know the craziest thing. And I forget this happened. I, it's still sometimes I'll remember, and so occasionally I'll tell someone. One night I was going down to class on the subway coming from the Upper West Side down mm-hmm. to HB, mm-hmm. pouring, pouring rain. Mm-hmm. I'm dressed like a, a, a slicker, nothing fancy. You know, we didn't have phones, probably a backpack. A guy follows me off at, like, the West 4th Street stop, stops me in the pouring rain and said, excuse me, um, are you an actress? And I thought to myself, I, I've never looked less like an actress right now. Maybe he knows we're all going down the street to West 4th, whatever. Probably. It turns out it's this famous director who asked me to come and audition for him. Who was it? Are you going to say? Jane, well, his name's James Toback. He's oh, my God. Okay, so he's been part of this Me Too thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I was Me Too'd. Because he wrote down his phone number, his address, and said, "I'd like you to come to my house and audition for me." I just did to this. His house. Yes, I just did this movie come called on. The Pickup Artist with uh, uh, Robert Downey yes. Jr. Yes, so I was like staring at him. You know, as a, as a struggling actor actress, you're kind of like, I want to believe okay. this is really okay. good thing, right? Like this is Showgirls. You'll I, do, yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't know how, because we didn't have the internet. Right. You could now pull that name up, and right away, Mm -hmm. you have 15 reasons why you're not going to his house. Right. I don't know what stopped me, either, but something said. Not on the up and up. And somehow, I don't know, I don't know where you found out information then, but looked, yes, he is indeed a director. He's indeed done a lot of big films. There was something about his need to, for enjoying some of the actresses and i was like okay come on yeah i'm sure you also sniff that you know in an animal sense like you isn't just that sort wild of sniff right the predator sure. yeah did you have you ever had that experience yeah, twice from males yes one for- was an agent and one was a guy who like we're from it promised me he would get me into magazines or something <sighs> it's so disappointing isn't it's it it's gross because 
Until, yeah, it is gross. Like, this is what you need to get laid? Yes. Fuck you. Right? Go get a job, and like, like a real one. It's, it's still going on, mm-hmm. you know, but in it's every industry. Yeah. It's, it's, it's much worse for women. Come on. You know, everybody gets it to a gr- I mean, even Terry Crews. It's horrible. Who wouldn't think that Terry Crews would get, like, it's just this big buff guy mm-hmm. would get sexually harassed, but, you know. It happens. Yeah. So then you're auditioning for f- theater, mm-hmm. film, mm-hmm. commercials. Whatever I can do. And then we, in our past crossed again, because I left New York, you know, a lot of falling in love having children, living in, back in Cleveland. And then my daughter gets the acting bug. So we come to New York for a summer, and that's where we would reconnect because yeah. her auditions were where you lived. Mm-hmm. And we still laugh so hard about walking down the street with you in Hell's Kitchen and how you would just start yelling out loud. You would be like, it smells like ass everywhere <laughs> I turn here on 10th Avenue. And my daughter, being young and, you know, from Cleveland, is like, wow, he's funny, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and we'd go to, like, the burger place, like that oh, nine yeah. napkin burger. Nine, and, um, a five napkin burger. Yep. So, so much fun. Mm-hmm. And it was so good to see you then looking marvelous, doing your thing. And then it's still kind of spinning my wheels. I mean, I've always like, if, if, if I were to have it scripted, or rather, you know, the path that I always really, I guess, wanted was to, you know, be an actor. You know, when I came to New York, I thought I wanted to be like Brad Pitt, like that kind of a star. Yes. I don't want that. No. Now. I, you now probably doesn't. figured it out. You just right. want to do your craft. Right. Yeah. I don't, I like... You know, now that I've gotten, like, I have a little bit of, I guess, fame now. I'm still not comfortable with it. But, like, I get stopped on the street occasionally. And it's nice. But mm-hmm. I would never, like, it, when it happens, it's nice. I would never want it to be on a level where I wouldn't be able to go outside without, like, a security detail or something. Can you like, imagine? I would hate to be, like, Madonna or something. Yeah, yeah. I, that is a life that I do not want. Right. You know, I, I want to be able to go to Zay bars and, okay, someone could say hi, love your videos or whatever. Yes. Um, but... Never where I'm, like, really harassed to the point of I can't operate, no. Um, but I just wanted to work and show up on a set, you know, for and do a supporting what, thing. Well, do what you love. Yes. So the passion that I know you've talked about recently, I believe, um, and I, I you were talking about one of your friends and having this debate about do what you're good at. Mm-hmm. I do think, though, what we're passionate about is usually what we're good at. If because you're lucky, those natural. two are the same thing. Right. Yes. Right. Because, like, I think, um, yeah, do what you love. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's plastered all over every we work. Yes. Yes. But do what you love is incomplete. It's yes. do what you love, comma, and be really fucking good at it. True. I agree. Like, if not better than somebody, be mm-hmm. able to do it in a way that nobody else can. Yeah. But I think the thing that you are good at is also what is innately you're supposed to be doing you know what I mean like you're good at being an actor Mm -hmm. you're good at you know doing the videos you do now interviewing guests but that don't you think that was part of you oh from growing up I've always I'm I'm my dad's kid back to that so it's I feel that that's that's what my show is about essentially is helping people understand that they're better off even if it's a rough road, doing what they love. 100%. Rather than faking it and trying to do something else because ultimately that's complete unhappiness. Right. And so even though that road is very windy, which is what we're talking about with you, it's still you're gratified now yeah. where you are. But again, yeah, you do have to like it. Like I was a good I was a good bartender. Yes. It's not my calling. Right. I was a really good web designer. Yes. Which is how I paid the rent for a lot of years. So but it was not my calling. But the web design you did in Cleveland mostly. No, I you did started it in New York. Oh yeah. So it why, got me out of waiting tables. That's right. So, but that's highly creative, and you have it to was. be also learn the good computer mm-hmm. skills. It wasn't out of nowhere. Like I, in college, I was a communication major, mm-hmm. so we did a lot of. In addition to all the theater I did, which mm-hmm. was not a legit major at the time. Right now it is. Now yeah. you can get credits at Boston College for theater, I believe, but. At the time I was there, it was just an extracurricular. Yeah. So 
I got into like I studied broadcast. Mm-hmm. I studied uh, ad copy and layout, and I loved like I loved. I still to this day like in, when I see an ad on the side of a bus or something, I'm always redesigning it in my head. Like yeah. I, that's the wrong font; it should be a different color. Like really? Oh, all the time. Oh my gosh, I could use your help. And uh, so the web design thing and the graphic design thing wasn't totally out of left field at all. Okay, it was very creative. So you started that here. I did. And then. George ended up moving back to Cleveland mm-hmm. um, for a number of reasons, really. Yeah. A little bit of burnout, a yep. little bit of trying to, let's make a new start. Mm-hmm. Let's help my mom, mm-hmm. who was at the time ailing. Mm-hmm. So uh, do you regret the choice at all? Of going to Cleveland? Mm-hmm. No. And again, we got to reconnect there, which was great yeah. and highly entertaining on George's <laughs> take of Cleveland and the men there. <laughs> we had a lot of discussions about that. Well, the oh. joke was that like there was gay pride in Cleveland, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to Public Square and meet the other two. <laughs> who are out. Who are out. Because if you it. really want to hit the gays, you got to hit the burbs and make sure no one else is home. <laughs> and make sure the, you know, the lights are at that sort of shame-based, oh my dim... Gosh. So it's, and it, don't tell anyone. Uh, you were great in Cleveland, and you gave it so much great publicity. Your pictures and the architecture, and uh, you really like um, did such a beautiful job with that. And I, I think have you such gave a crush it. Our town. it. You gave it its due. Mm-hmm. It just again, it was it wasn't you. No. And then, so why fake it again? You you weren't finding what you needed there, and I respect I think, that. Right. I couldn't find a tribe. I couldn't find. Um, my line about Cleveland is kind of like half joking was that it's a great town for um, um, heterosexual, sports loving, beer drinking, meat eating car owners, of which I am not. Like, I don't tick <laughs> any of those boxes. I did not have a car. I don't eat meat. I'm not a drinker. And I'm really not into sports. So Cleveland is not for you, buddy. Oh my God. Right? That is perfect. So I tried. You tried. And you lit. You did have a, that beautiful space you lived in. God, was amazing. It was sick. Yeah, that was beautiful. I George lived downtown, and he only biked, mm-hmm. or took Uber or mm-hmm. public transit. Yeah, which people thought was weird. So then, um, you come back to New York. I you got a find job. the. You got the job. Yeah, as a concierge. Mm-hmm. For a plastic surgeon, correct? Cosmetic dermatologist. Cosmetic dermatologist, mm-hmm. which I mean, I was so fascinated about. It's there's fascinating. So much we have to talk about in that regard. Yeah. Of which I don't need everyone hearing all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> and George, I'm totally George happened to also um, have a few celebs passing there. Some mm-hmm. of my people that I'm obsessed with. Again, I won't. I won't bore all the listeners. However, at that time, then we have COVID. Mm-hmm. Then you're out of a job. I was yeah, I was furloughed for about two and a half months. And then that is when George did something. Again, it was just your innate um, desire to be doing something. Like, to be, like it was performative therapy. Performative. Have you? Has anyone ever named anything that? Is I there think such we just a thing? Now. That is so cool. I love it. Yeah. Performative therapy in the realm of it, it was Instagram. Was it Instagram Live? It it went on Twitter first. Okay. Do you mean the video that went viral? Yes. It was, that was a reaction to, um, uh, there was a writer I really like and I know on Twitter we've never met in person. I have a lot of like social media friends that I've never met in person. Yeah. Um, Molly Jong Fast is one of them. Okay. And she writes for the Daily Beast and contributes to Vogue. Very politically vocal. Um... Uh, she's she and I politically are of the same stripe. Sure. And smart, funny. And she was talking about, on a podcast she has, talking about how she would put up pictures. This was last summer when, like, the, the narrative in the news media was that New York was a hellscape. Yeah. And there were fires and there's crime and people are being killed. And it's like, what? I'm right here. Yeah. Who's telling you this? Yes. Um, the same thing happens with my daughter, Lily. Mm-hmm. Because I'll read some crazy stuff, and I'll be like, did you hear about the da-da-da? And the person off the subway, she goes, Mom, what are you watching and listening? Right. I, we're fine. Yeah. Like, if, I'm fine here in Brooklyn. If it, <laughs> if it bleeds, it leads. Yes. Right. So I literally had listened to her, and then she had tweeted something about it. And I literally pulled up my phone. Mm-hmm. I'm walking the dogs down Columbus Avenue. Yep. And honestly, one take, like... 
I snipped off the beginning and snipped off the end, but like one take, and I had this like fake meltdown about the hellscape that is yes. New York, and I'm walking past Big Gay Ice Cream, and people are having dinner, and um, and then I uploaded it to Twitter, and then Molly spun it around. It first lived on Twitter mm-hmm. and only Twitter. Okay. Molly spun it around, and Molly has a huge following, so that kind of. That's how it started. I owe it all to Molly. So I'm not in the Twitter universe so much. I mean, I was for a second. And um, that is where it started. Mm -hmm. And then a couple other people picked it up. So when you share on Instagram. so I eventually put it on Instagram. It's on your Instagram, Mm -hmm. a number of them. Um, And I thought it was hysterical. And you also do the voice of um, like a Karen. Mm -hmm. For me. For me. (laughs) Now, every, you guys, oh my god! Now every time I say it, I hear that. I just go, I just go for me, and then I'm like, oh my god, uh-huh. I wh- who am I? But it's not even about that stuff. <laughs> I'll be like for me, and then I'm like for me. <laughs> it's like for me is one of those like conversational ticks that drives me up a wall. Not all the time. Well, like sometimes for me is. But now I catch just... myself realizing how much you say it. I say yeah. it. And I'm sort of like, I was kind of like popping that balloon a little bit. So what I think is so cool, George, is that performative therapy, this is all part of just being a creative, Mm -hmm. which is what you are. Mm -hmm. And so now this has pushed you into another realm. Right. So just the, like you, like all these kids today who maybe don't want to put in the work. Right. They just want, Mm -hmm. but you put in all the work. Oh, yeah. Years of work and years of work. And who would have thought? But what you see is, it's not like, you know, like, um. It's taken 30 years to be an overnight success. That's, yes. You know, like what you see, what people watch, what I'm doing on the, with those videos and on social media is not just, that. that's my entire life experience. Absolutely. Those are a bunch of different characters Absolutely. that I have observed, I've played, I've done. It's not just something that's just like I invented overnight. Yes. Um, and, you know, as we get older, we, I have, yeah, it's an accumulation. It is a lint roll of shit that I have rolled through my entire life and producing this that no one can do what I do the way I do it. Right. It's your body of work. Uh Uh-huh. So after the video was picked up by a few big celebrities, then the attention on you has been bigger and bigger. Yeah. Is how does that feel? I like it. I mean I'm a narcissist with low self esteem, so it's like really good (laughs) to like I love attention, but at the same time I'm always questioning why someone's paying attention to me. Like, I don't feel worthy. I have imposter syndrome. I'm, I'm like, I'm textbook. Like, I have imposter syndrome, syndrome a go-go. Uh, you know, so when someone like Kara Swisher is like, be my guest co-host on Pivot, I'm like, why would she want me? You know. Um, you were marvelous. I had a blast. Yeah, doing you were it. great. Thank you. And um, so, yeah. And like, even on, like, when I got Sex in the City, great example. Yeah. When I got cast, when I got that call. Mm-hmm. First thing that went through my mind was their first, second, and third choice turned it down. I was on the D list. So you haven't gotten better, not better. You haven't gotten more self esteem. It's it's still on the same level. No, I have. I certainly have more confidence, and I would say that in terms of getting what you want, or getting what I want, and getting through life and pushing through things. Um. I'm better at understanding that a lot of people, if not everybody, to a certain degree, has that same kind of fear, some more than others. Absolutely. And that whole fake it till you make it, fake it till you feel it thing, I know that if I don't push it, if I don't fake my way through a conversation, it's not going to happen. Absolutely. So as, like, I'm not 25 anymore. I don't have as much time left. Mm -hmm. Do it. Yeah. Um, It sucks that I, like, I'm, you know, I've been discovered at 51 yeah, but it's better than I not being it more. discovered and I'm or a lot giving more, up. And I'm a lot more grateful. Yeah. Because I think if I had hit it, like if I had become like a star or something at 25, there's a part of me that th- knowing how I was at 25. Yeah. It was like before I got sober, um, there's a part of me that thinks I would have fucked it up. Yeah. You know, I mm-hmm. didn't have this, I, you know, I, I had a really good upbringing, as I said. I'm grateful for the parents I have. Um. But there's a part of me that thinks it's the alcoholic in me. Like, I, I think I would have fucked it up. But now there's, a, like, I look at things very differently. 
Um, I've done a lot of, you know, self-exploration and self-examination, and my attitude about this kind of attention um, is much more different. Yeah. Much more different than it would have been, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm far more grateful. Who, who is the most famous person in your phone? <laughs> Oh, that's tough. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I will just say this because I don't want to be gross, but like, um, there are—I guess there are some A-listers in my phone, but it's not for the sake of—and I'm hesitant about like naming names, only because you know it's easy to think like, oh, so and so, I'm on so and so's radar, and you get that little like dopa hit from it, like. Sure. <gasps> So and so is like likes me. Yeah. The truth is, yes, that so and so likes me, and I'm in that so and so sort of circle in a way. But I actually really like that person. Yeah. Like it's not just for. It's not that shameless star fucky thing. Yeah. I genuinely like these people, and I've gotten to know them, and the way that I've gotten to know them. So, you know, out of respect and discretion. Sure. You know. I'm not going to be that guy, but um, uh, yeah, I was having a dialogue today, this morning, and one of them, um, a a very well-known person, and I texted her, and I said, um, you know, she was very congratulatory about the Jerry Seinfeld interview, and she... um, and, she, and I said, I know that you know how much, because she lost her dad too. And I said, I know that you know how much you'd lo- I'd love to call my dad. And she said the most amazing things to me. Hmm. And so it's not just like, you know, yeah, she happens to be a famous person, but it's not about like, she's a real person right. who has really meant something in my life, and yeah. it's a gift of this attention, and you know, I'm not friends with everybody who's like started to pay attention to me. It's not sure. about that. Like, yeah, you know, you you know. So you've been pleasantly surprised. Yeah, and she imparted on me these words in our text exchange that were so helpful to me this morning. Aww. You know, she said, "Look at a picture of him." Yeah. And she was right. And she said everything that she said everything that your father did mm-hmm. was that so that you could do this. Totally. Totally. You yeah, know, that's, that's a gift. beautiful, yeah. And so, yeah, I have these, you know, I've, met, I've got these interesting people in my life because of this attention I've gotten, but at the same time, they're really good people, and it's a gift. That's great. Yeah. Um, so what George was just, re- to which he was just referring, the Jerry Seidfeld interview, as a result, again, of his, the videos and attention by people in all sorts of fields who want to see you succeed and do more right it's you most recently just were picked up by extra tv to do an interview with oh my gosh jerry seinfeld which happened yesterday the interview was wednesday we're recording this on a friday october 1st the interview was wednesday september 29th two days ago so i thought it was fantastic i almost pooped myself (laughs) Honestly. Did you just sit down with him or did you have any banter before? I just said, I had met Jerry before. I um, am friendly with uh, his wife on Instagram and Twitter. Okay. With Jerry and I follow, Jerry follows me on Twitter. I follow him. Yeah. Um, he, I came on his radar because of that, you know, that first video I did that went viral, um, got his attention also. Um, but I was walking down, um, uh, I was walking to work one day and literally ran into Jessica Seinfeld and Jerry was there and so I have this I've met him before we had a very pleasant exchange this was many many months ago and um, I mean don't think for a second I sat down on the subway after that conversation I was like holy shit I just met Jerry Seinfeld (laughs) 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 that is quite a New York moment (laughs) very New York moment like where else right where else do you get this so um, 
so yeah, Jerry and I were not we're not like total strangers. So we had that moment. So before mm-hmm. they rolled the cameras, Jerry and I did have a you know a nice. That is stuff, fantastic. You know? yeah. I think that, that is like a marvelous thing for you to be doing. They're lucky to have you. I had a blast. You could. Would you like to do more being a host? I would love my own show. I'll just put it you out there. What, Let's George? manifest it. I want a show. I want to be like. Like and you should have your own show. Well, I want. I think we're on your own show right now, or at least a, a starting point. You're right. This I is my own show. Too, but I I'm guess. Lazy. I guess. I would like to do like like a Kelly. I you know I love Kelly Ripa and I, that Who job. Doesn't? That job Once to me is her. like my dream job. She's a cool cat. I know we'd be best friends if she's if, hilarious. Yeah, she's got a great sense yeah, of humor. and she's a Libra too, like me. Oh. Um, anyway, and she looks super hot and like oh, you. Um. She's got her act together I, like I, you. I would love a show. Like, this is why I'm doing this show. Mm-hmm. Because I find I could I would love to do it every day. Because mm-hmm. it's fascinating to me. Yeah. So, yes, podcast for you. And, or we could But just... I want an on-camera show. Like Dick Cavett or, yes. Al, um, or Gore Vidal. Like, I love those. It's just... There's who's... not much like that today. No. I think the closest I've seen it today mm-hmm. um, was... Without the quirkiness, um, David Letterman had, has that Netflix thing, like My Next Guest Needs No Introduction, that I show. I loved it. I do, too. And I love the tone of it. Yes. It's relaxed. Um, there's that an is audience, cool. Yeah. And I like, you know, it, Dave is not constrained by any, not that the network ever gave a shit after a certain point. They would, he could write his own ticket. But he's not constrained by, um, you know, network rules. He can kind of do his own thing. Yeah. And I think... Because I'm genuinely curious. Like, the questions I had for Jerry. Yeah. Like, I got some questions as a guide. Sure. But I, you know, sort of, as as I said to the executive producer, I said, those questions are like the branches of the tree. I'm going to put leaves and decorations on the tree. Yeah. Because there are things that I genuinely want to know about. Yeah. And that's, I did my, I had seven minutes with them. So it was like really tight. That is super fast. No, Yes. And they have to cut that down to three and a half minutes. And so speaking of uh, questions like that, what would be, if you, when you look at all the movies and actors, what would have been your dream role? Oh, God. My dream role. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. If I'm going to be rigorously honest, because there's a part of me that's like, you know, I want to do something really deep. You know, truly. <laughs> You know what I'm thinking about right now, and it's embarrassing, but I'll say it anyway? Wes Craven, native Clevelander, who directed the Scream movies, Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, I didn't know he was a Clevelander. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would have loved to have been, because I was, those movies are Generation X horror movies. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to have been one of the killers. Seriously? In a Scream movie. Yes. Because, like, you think he's one thing, it's really like a guess who done it kind of a thing, but then there's the killer. Um, I would have. <laughs> I just recently saw, like, I recently watched. Um, instead of watching the Met Ball, I watched Ocean's Eight. Did you ever see it? So was Ocean's Eight the one with the women? Yes. Yes, I love it. So yeah, um, um, Bullock plays Clooney's like yes. sister. Yes. You know, it's a cr- it's a it's a criming family. Uh huh. And um, there was a role in that movie, uh, playing played by James Corden. He plays the insurance company investigator okay and it just he comes into the story it's very clever scenes it's very clever dialogue he gets to be witty and then he's done yeah i love that i would love to do that yes oh well i'm sure we can get you a role like that you know like i don't want i don't need to like i was having conversations with people and maybe i'm selling myself short i don't know maybe people see something in me that i don't see but i was having conversations with some people you know, in the wake of this moment I'm in or whatever, they're like, we need to do a show around you. And I'm just like, whoa, what? You know? Oh. Like, like a narrative, like, like a scripted you like your own Netflix show. series. And I'm like thinking. A, like a, um, oh, Seinf- and maybe I need like to a think. Like a Seinfeld, like, or wait, even kind, better, um, curb I mean, your enthusiasm. Right. <laughs> like the conversation was like that. And I was like, I never, like, honestly, Anne, the dream was never that big. Um, I and know, maybe but I it, need could, to, uh, it could unfold that way. That could be what's I'm next. I'm wide open to it. Yeah. I was telling you before we started talking how my life has been that cartoon of the baby crawling on the construction beam and about to go over the edge, and then another beam comes up and picks the baby up, and then the baby keeps crawling and is about to fall again, and then there comes another beam. Like, that has been my life. Absolutely. 
You know, like when when I, you know, I worked for Joan Rivers. That's right. We didn't even talk about that. George but also worked for Joan Rivers, which was a fantastic Amazing job opportunity. Yeah. And it was a, I call it the unicorn that knocked on my door. And that is another example of that. I wasn't but looking I, for but it. But it's like life's, the, life has a way of doing that. If yeah. you're open to it. You have to show up. Yes. You know, yes. as, as you, it, it, here's, if I could leave your listeners with one thing, or hopefully more than one thing, but um, yes, follow your passion, be super good at it, and also, like, I did a lot of websites and website work and then social media work with clients when I was in that phase of my life, and they would often say, should I be on Facebook, or should I be on social media, or should I have a blog? Yeah. When they would say to me, should I have a blog, I would say no. I said, why? I said, because you had to ask. Mm -hmm. If you're wondering, the right question is, I have legal pads full of shit that I got to talk about that I want to get to. Totally. Can you help me organize this yes. in a blog fashion? Yes, I can yes. help you with that. But can I help someone make it? Should I have a blog? No, you shouldn't. Because you you're asking the say. wrong. No. <laughs> That's so true. Because, you know, the, the web is hospice for so many abandoned blogs. We don't need another one. Completely. It's a graveyard for blogs that have been ditched because it's too much work. Yeah. People think it's easy. Think, people think a podcast is easy. It's not. But um, if you want to get hit by lightning, you have to put yourself out in the rain. Absolutely. And I have not, like, the older I get, the less fucks I give, yeah. the less I care about getting wet. Um, another thing that George does is he has a blog. You have a newsletter mm -hmm. um, that can find you at georgehan.com, H-A-H-N, um, not to be confused with the other famous Han, uh, Elizabeth <laughs> Han, who is George's cousin. Catherine. Catherine Han. I'm sorry. Catherine Han, uh, who's a lovely person, also She's a amazing. Clevelander. And I remember her mom and dad very well. <laughs> anyway. Hilarious. Hilarious people. Anyway, um, so georgehan.com is like your landing ground for anything that it's they want to the find out about right. George Han. The website is kind of like the sun and the solar system of all the things that I do. Everything else is like a satellite of that. And then the Instagram Live, which is always fascinating mm -hmm. and interesting. And then um, one of George's departments that I haven't even touched on is his incredible style and attention to dressing mm -hmm. and fashion. He looks marvelous today. If you tune into YouTube my YouTube channel, you'll see what he has on. <laughs> and he always looks amazing. And actually, George, I have shown it to men who I think could use mm -hmm. your help because it's informative, it's simple, it's not expensive. Mm -mm. It's just having the right couple of items, details, correct? I think it's hilarious when people think that I'm rich. You look rich. Because I mean, if, I'm if, clean if, if, and yes. because it's tailored, I, it I doesn't guess I cost shouldn't money. say that you look rich. You look very well put together. And so what what's I love is that you're showing a lot of men how you do that mm -hmm. with basic pieces. Let me backtrack that even further. Mm -hmm. Like years ago, I made a decision because I always looked at guys who dress like I do now. Yeah. I was never a total – I never frumped out totally. Like I never gave up and, you know, went full elastic waistband. But – um. I remember looking, I think it was like sometime after I saw like Casino Royale or something like that. And I said, you know what? Everybody looks at that guy, James Bond, mm -hmm. and wants to be that, would love to be that guy. They would love to have those clothes. They would love to have that car. They would love, well, I wouldn't want that lifestyle because it's lonely. How, why would you want that? Like, I would never want that life. But, it hurts. Right. <laughs> it's a lonely life, that life of an assassin. <laughs> so... <laughs> But I love your love of James Bond because I have the same love. Find me one like warm-blooded male that doesn't want to be that guy and yeah. doesn't envy how he looks. Yeah. I know that a lot of guys would love to do that, but they're afraid to do it because they're afraid to get too dressy. Yeah. So I'm just going to frump out in some sneakers. Yeah. Well, not to discredit, there is a cool sneaker culture For sure. that I totally appreciate and love. Mm hmm um, it's not for me, but right. I, I get for it. Me. Like, it's not for me, <laughs> but I get it. No, but I, a lot of guys are afraid yeah. to get too dressy. Absolutely. Like to be too fancy. And I one day just said, you know what? Fuck that. Yeah. I'm going to do it. There's nothing about my job with the doctor, my concierge job that requires me to wear a suit. It was a choice and he loves it. And the patients love it. 
<laughs> you look amazing. I, you know, Paul Feig, my favorite, one of my favorite working directors today, wears tailored custom suits and on ties the on the set. Wow, every, that, that's his drag. Wow. And he made that decision years ago that he was going to look like that. There's nothing about that job that requires it. So when guys say, "Oh, you have to wear a suit," I don't. I get to wear a suit. Yeah. I choose to. And if the suit's uncomfortable, fire your tailor. Absolutely. Because it should be comfy, right? I feel like I'm wearing pajamas right now. You I'm don't look like it at all. Thank you look you. like a million bucks. Thank you. I feel like a hundred. Um, <laughs> I have to ask you another. What was your first Doors time? opened what for me your... when I started dressing like this. Right? I got better tables in restaurants. See? People treat you differently. Yeah, absolutely. They're like, I don't know who he is, but he looks like he's somebody. Give him that good table. Yeah. Because he looks let like him he in. he looks like he runs shit. Yeah. He looks like he runs uh, you know, an international luxury conglomerate. Absolutely. No one's quite sure why. <laughs> you just pay attention. Yeah. Um, I love your bracelet, by the way. It's Thank a you. it's an ID bracelet. Okay. I want one of those. In case I fall down and forget who I am. Does it say something on the inside? No. Return to. <laughs> it's just my initials on the outside. I love that. It's from I, Tiffany's. I want that. Did someone give it to you? It was a gift years ago. From a lovely person. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing I like to ask people: What was your first concert? Because music's a foundation yeah. for you. Mm-hmm. I listen to your playlists. I'm also musically obsessed. I used to tell people, like, my taste in music is, like, all over the place. And I used to have all my CDs alphabetized. I had, like, thousands of them, right? Yeah. And and they were all alphabetized. So when someone says, what kind of music do you like? Did, do you like? I said, um, Barry Manilow was in between Madonna and Marilyn Manson. Ah. Uh. All right, and that's yeah. not, you know, I can get into show tunes. I yes. like some classical yes. pieces. Yes. Like I, jazz, huge one. Yeah. Like, I'm all over the place. Totally. I'm a music fan. Um, my first concert? Gosh. My brother Mike took me to see Pink Floyd at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. It was the Momentary Lapse of Reason tour. Oh, my God. That was my first concert. Wow. Good one. That's a real good one. Yeah. I mean, mine was Michael Stanley Band at Blossom. Oh, MSB. I know, but still, Pink Floyd is pretty. That's pretty ridiculous. How that? old were you? I'd have to look back at when that tour happened. Um, I want to say early to mid-'80s. I was maybe not even a teenager. Is there a show you've seen recently that's been pretty moving? Like any show? Well, I guess initially I meant a concert, a musical concert, but... Or a live performance? The most, well, I did get, I went to um, the New York Homecoming tour show, a concert in Central Park that got rained out because we had a hurricane blowing through. And it, like, the show got cut off right in the middle of Barry Manilow's set. I died. In the middle, was he singing Mandy? Yes. No. He was singing, how did you know? I just guessed. And he was in the middle of, like, he did one, I forget, he came out, he started with Copacabana. Stop it. And then he went into Mandy. Oh. And then he was about, and then he sat down at the piano and was about to start something else. And then, like, the mic got cut off. And I, there is a picture of me on Instagram. My friend Lori took it. And I'm just like, I, what the fuck? I mean, it was Barry Manilow. That's pretty epic. It was way epic. Oh. So that was kind of emotional, but like in a happy way. Yeah. The most emotional night I ever spent, two shows I can think of on Broadway. Not necessarily recent. Um, I got to see, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman as oh. Willie Loman oh. in Death of a Salesman, directed by Mike Nichols. Uh, opening night, my friend Kelly was the wardrobe supervisor on the show. Or she might have been a dresser. I can't remember. I'm sorry, Kelly, if I get that wrong. Um, and I was her guest opening night. Mm. And I got to see that. Mm. And there was not a, like, everybody was sobbing at the end. I mean, Phil was too young for that role. Right. But, like, you believed it because he just was so good. I was just talking about him with Lily this morning because she said his son is come. His mm-hmm. son is in that new. Yeah, the new um, so- uh, um soprano um no. prequel. No, you're thinking no. of James Gandolfini. Okay, that's right. So wait, what's the son in? The son is in Paul Thomas Anderson's new movie. Also a Clevelander. Yes. Isn't that wild? So was that performance? Was he? Was it just? an incredible performance on his part yes or the whole show the whole production mike nichols did not f- mess around mike nichols was a master 
at making films, and I'd never seen anything directed him on stage, like yeah. a theater thing. Yeah. Um, just, it was so beautiful. Yeah. And um, the other emotional night was actually the revival, the Broadway revival of A Chorus Line. Because A Chorus Line was the very first play I saw in a Broadway theater. My dad brought me with him to New York on a business trip. Yes. And The Chorus Line was in, the, in its initial run. Oh, my. At the Schubert Theater. And my dad took me to see it. I was maybe 11. And Rosie. I didn't I mean, give a shit. It was magical. And then what, what was going through your head? I... The first time, yeah, I, I, I was like, what, what, "It's this is it? Like this is wow!" I was just like, "I don't think I breathe because there's no intermission in that show," yeah. and I was just like, "I don't think I blinked or breathed for ninety oh minutes." It was magical, oh and I never God. had an aspiration to be a dancer. That's not the point of that show. It was just the whole artistic production mm -hmm. over the top. Yes, it's beautiful, One. and it's about our vulnerabilities <laughs> and breaking down, like peeling that onion. I love it. Oh, my gosh. George, I feel like we could talk, go on and on here, couldn't we? Yeah, we should I, do a part two. I think we should do a part two. Or we should do – can you do Instagram Live with two people? Yeah, I did you one can? with – I've done them a few times. I think we should do that. I'd I think it would be to. real fun. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of pop culture that I'd like to get into you with, or like the stuff that goes on on a daily basis. Yeah. Just there's things that just – I don't know. We could go on. We could go on. There's a lot to go on. <laughs> But I have loved this uh, scratching the surface for a lot of people who don't know you, mm -hmm. who have found my podcast on Apple and Spotify and my website, AnnRichardsInspires.com. There's a link to all my podcasts in, if you need help finding them. Um, if you need help, help. I'm also a life coach, which is a result of, like we discussed, living a life, mm -hmm. a body of work. And because of that, what can I help? someone with you know what let I mean let go of fear yeah you're either in fear or love you know that with like oftentimes people say fear stands for you know all this yes. right false evidence appearing as reality mm -hmm. as real or fuck everything and run <laughs> -E I like that one better fuck everything and run That's I like fear. that better yeah fuck everything and run that is fear mm -hmm. and it's all over the place it is oh it's at the bottom of everything mm -hmm. but I I'm so thrilled for you, George, because Thank this you. is just the beginning. The it's, I'm, I'm, it's one it's day at a time. It's a new beginning. It's one a new day beginning. at a time, and I'm, it's, it's, and I'm surfing the wave, and I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so everyone, please stay tuned what George has going. I'm sure you'll see him on the TV soon in his own um, show. My own Dick Cavett show. The George Hahn <laughs> show. I would love to do it. would be cool to have it, like, not constrained by a network kind of time constraint. I, you know, it could be 15 minutes, could be 30 minutes, depending on who I'm talking to and what we're talking about. But I loved, like, I loved what I got to do with Jerry. I wanted to do it longer. Heck, yeah. You know, I had seven minutes with him. I understand the tightness I mean, of a press I mean, we've had junket. about 60 minutes, and I feel like there's so much more. I know. It's hard. It's hard to put it all together. When you're with people that are interesting. Yes, 100%. <laughs> no. Seven minutes can be too long with certain people. True. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's too long with a lot of people, Yeah, actually. <laughs> I've had relationships that didn't last that long. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> but that's for part three. <laughs> that is definitely part three. We didn't even get into romance. There's so much. There's none. <laughs> Again, part three because I think we just covered it. If Next you subject. if you saw this man, and uh, you've definitely heard him, you don't. Uh, there's got to be romance. No, there's not. Okay, maybe that's where my life coaching can help you. <laughs> <laughs> help me meet someone who isn't gonna give me headache and heartache. That would be helpful. And a disease. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I love you, George. I love you. We Annie. will do this again. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you.